Hi, so I'm Felix, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what Melbourne Inclusions can tell us about Vitarica Volcano in Chile. Um, this is uh, part of some work that's been going on since about 2020, and we're finally getting results. So it's, yeah, it's a good time. It's pretty exciting. So where is Vitarica Volcano? It's in the south of Chile. It's in the southern volcanic zone. In fact, the central southern volcanic zone. It's the, the red triangle there. And interestingly about this region is that the volcanism is strongly controlled by the tectonics. Um, almost all major shadow volcanoes in the area, the, the black triangles are associated with the Laquini Ofki fault zone, which is a 1,200 kilometer fault zone that goes roughly north, northeast to south, south west. Vitarica is also part of an oblique chain uh, to this, um, which is thought to be about an a ancient regional tectonic boundary. Why, do we, why is Vitarica interesting? Well, it's very active. It's had over 50 eruptions since 1558. Um, so it's been erupting for over 100,000 years and it has a big range of eruptive styles from Hawaiian spatter at the sort of persistent lava lake um, to subplenary eruptions, though they're much older. Uh, some examples of historic eruptions to give you a, a sort of idea of the range. On the left, there's the no, uh, November 1984 eruption where effusive lava flows incise the, the summit glacier. And then on the, right, on the right, there's the most recent eruption um, which was much more intense. Uh, it was a big fire fountain, almost one and a half kilometers high, but the whole eruption was only about 20 minutes long. And as I said, we've had sort of everything away at subpinion eruptions, although those are primarily much older. But despite this sort of massive range in eruptive style, uh, almost everything is sort of basaltic andesite, basalt to basaltic andesite. Um, so maybe we need to look a bit more deeper than whole rock, just a whole rock. So this is where melt inclusions come in. Um, unlike ground mass glass, which is typically thought to represent the final uh, liquid in a, in a magmatic system, or whole rock data, which can be sort of is the average between ground mass glass and uh, crystalline phases, which can be uh, sort of affected by entrainment of antichrists. Uh, melt inclusions, in theory, sample magmatic liquids deep in the magmatic system as crystals grow. Um, and therefore can preserve melt uh, prior to extensive crustal processing and, and during, and therefore can give us insight about what's actually going on deep in the magmatic system. Um, they also track volatile contents, which may otherwise be degassed and we otherwise can't see. Um, so on the left, there's a picture of a, a typical Vitarican melt inclusion. I'd like to point out that it's, it's typically made out of two parts. There's the glass, which is the brown, the brown bit, um, and they often contain a vapour bubble, which usually partitions all the CO2 into it. And it's only really in the last sort of 10 years that we kind of refined the methods to, to measure this CO2. And they, these bubbles are important. They can contain up to sort of 90% plus of the total CO2. So if we want to reconstruct depths from volatile saturation pressures, measuring this CO2 in this bubble is really important. So the key questions trying to answer at, at Vitarica is, are, are mode inclusions recording different things to the whole rock? Are there distinct compositions between different eruptions? And are they variable within a single eruption? And can that tell us something about the magmatic system? And also do the mag uh, saturation pressures we get from these mode inclusions support the application of a transcrustal magmatic system model at Vitarica Volcano? And does that have implications for, for hazard assessment? So the analytical workflow that we've sort of been undergoing for quite a while now is quite complicated. Um, initially, we identified uh, mode inclusions from five tephras from about 14,000 years ago, some of these big, uh, large mafic ignimbrites, all the way through to the most recent eruption in 2015, that, that sort of intense lava fountain. Um, so we start off by using micro round spectroscopy to measure the CO2 in that bubble. Um, we then moved on to secondary ionization mass spectrometry to measure the volatile content and the traces in that glass, the brown glass. Uh, then we move on to microprobe analyses to measure the major elements and that the composition of the host crystal. And so I have to make a confession. Uh, we got uh, a bit held up just before Christmas. So if you came for five tephras, I'm afraid I've only got three and you just have to, you have to make do with that. And then this year we're going to move on to do, using thermalizer, thermal ionization mass spectrometry to get the isotopic contents of these individual melt inclusions. So we take all, all of these different analytical methods and they give us a lot of information. And we get sort of over 36 dimensionality data. We're measuring at least 36 different elements in these individual melt inclusions. So we can use the volatiles to calculate entrapment pressures and understand the gassing behavior. Use the major and trace elements to understand magmatic evolution. And the isotopes and traces will help us understand what's inputting into, the, into these magmatic systems. 
Okay. okay, so now we're going to move on to the, the first question. Are there compositional differences between eruptions? And with 36 dimensions, I could have shown a very, very large number of plots. Um, instead, I've chosen to do something slightly different. Um, so this is a PC, this is PCA. This is a, a principal component analysis of all, of all these node inclusions. Um, and you kind of think of that as a plane that intersects these 36 dim uh, dimensional data. Uh, and it's designed to maximize the variation you can see. Um, and you can see that there's a fair bit of spread, um, but the different eruptions seem to be sort of clustered a little bit. So we have the Pecan in the purple, is that one of the large mafic ignimbrites. The Chimera is a sort of intermediate size full deposit. And then we have the 2015 eruption in sort of brown green, and that's the most recent intense lava fountain. And sort of a theme now, the 2015 eruption seems to be distinct compositionally from, from the other two. <laughs> Okay, we, we can see there's some spread on that past well, within eruptions. I'm going to show one trace element ratio plot as not to induce too much fatigue this early on. Um, and this is the sort of thing we can use the use the trace elements to understand. So we can we can plot uh, elements that we think are coming from the slab. We think are just coming from the slab to, to understand their contribution and elements that are uh, fractionated during or, or incompatible, which can tell us about the degree of mantle melting that's going on. And the main point of this plot is just to show that even within one, the inclusions of one eruption, there's a lot of spread. So that suggests that the magmatic system at Villarica is potentially more complex than just the whole rock is giving us. Now I'll talk about a little about volatile contents. So we're going to plot uh, water content versus CO2 content, the main volatile is in, in we find in magmatic uh, mode inclusions. And we can see them, the, they're somewhat variable. Um, this is where the, the measuring the bubble really comes into it. In the, the gray squares now are, are sort of literature measurements of CO2 contents and water contents. And we can see they're generally at the bottom of what we what we measure when we take into account this bubble. So if we can account for the bubble and we accept that this high, really high CO2 value for the chain, oh, really high CO2 is real, um, we get up to six times more, more CO2. Um, in general, we find that over 90% of the CO2 is found within the vapor bubble. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can see that the, the 2015 data is, is pulling pretty low compared to the, the Pecan and the Chimea. And it's kind of a weird shape. It's, it's pretty vertically distributed, which is not really what we necessarily expect from degassing. Um, this had us thinking maybe something else is going on. Maybe we're not measuring what we think we're measuring or something's happened to the water. Um, so a potential option is dehydration. So if you heat up an olivine water can, can uh, diffuse out of the out of the inclusion pretty quickly. Um, and that maybe makes sense uh, given the style of the eruption. Um, we usually expect uh, sort of really intense fire fountain to be driven by hot magma. So maybe the heat of the carry liquid is driving this. So we thought, how can we test this? Um, so we decided to use a, a hygrometer that's not measuring water directly, but instead, instead using a proxy. Uh, which is calcium in this case, um, and we compare the, the the water we measured with SIMS to the water we're getting from from the calcium, and we're using the Gavrilenko 2016 uh, hygrometer, which is calibrated on art magmas, so it's probably not a bad choice. And we find that these, in fact, these 2015 uh, mode inclusions seem to have higher water contents or the highest water contents, and therefore maybe have undergone a large amount of dehydration, which again maybe tells us something about uh, the carrier liquid for the 2015. Um, we're sort of still working through this bit. So we can also take these um, volatile uh, data and calculate the pressure at which uh, these mole inclusions were entrapped at. And we see that when we do that, we get a large range of entrapment pressures from about two kilometers all the way down to 22 kilometers. Um, the shallowest of these sort of correspond to geophysical data we have for the 2015 eruption. So in the shallow, sort of shallow up across well, shallow crust we have from about four to five plus or minus some error bars, some seismicity and uh, the post 2015 reinflation with the black line. But we can see we get a much larger range of depths than this sort of, sort of geophysical signal might suggest. Um, and this maybe leads us to think that the 2015 eruption was was uh, caused by slightly different magma storage than than these bigger eruptions. Uh, and maybe supports a scent of sort of volatile rich magma through the rapidly through the crust. Takeaways. 
different eruptions of Illyrica appear to have uh, variable, distinct and variable melt inclusion compositions, suggesting that uh, the magma storage of Illyrica is somewhat complex, maybe more complex than just whole rock would suggest. Uh, melt inclusions sort of support this and suggest that magma storage is also quite complicated with multiple regions of storage throughout the mid to upper crust. And then I like to really sort of drive home that uh, the reason we get these big range of saturation pressures is because we measure the, the CO2 in the bubble. So it's probably worth putting the hard work in to do that. Um, for future work, collect the rest of my probe data and sort of refine the uncertainties in some of these, these values. Then collect the isotopic data for individual mode inclusions and see if, how that adds to the story. And then maybe relate uh, the compositions to time scales from iron magnesium diffusion chronometry. Thank you very much.